So, boys and girls, um, this is Jerry um, speaking to you, um, and I'm going to continue on from where Man finished. And um, I think Man did a lot of vector on, on differential, partial differentiation with you. And what I want to do now is I want to show you how partial differentiation is sometimes used in engineering mathematics and analysis. Now, this is a very important little little subtopic, vector calculus, and you, those of you in particular in electronics will see this again. So uh, it's, it's, it is an important thing. So there's a few definitions. There are three definitions that you need to get into your brains. The definition of the gradient of a scalar field, the divergence of a vector field, and the curl of a vector field. Those, those three things. So you need to be able to do those. And if you do those well, then you get marks, and then you go into, into the second part of the second year whatever that means in the context of the COVID. I don't know what, what, what's in store for us folks, all right? Because I don't know what the next step back from this is. Like what's, what I, I don't know how we can reduce this any further. So um, yeah, so let's, let's, let's get started. Right, so um, the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is I want to introduce this terminology about fields. Now, when I was your age and I was starting off in this game, um, uh, people used to use these ter different terms and I would have no idea what they meant. And usually, actually, when, you, when you, you're in the game for a while, you realize that they don't mean that much, but they should be defined right at the beginning. And one of these things is the idea of a field. So um, let's recap a little bit first. Uh, you, you know how to partially differentiate functions of several variables. So let me just give you an example. Uh, let's look at this function of x, y, and z. So it's 3x to the power of 6y minus 6y over z. Now, what you want to do is you want to partially differentiate f with respect to x, and that's the um, notation here. And when you do that, folks, what you do is you differentiate x as you would normally. So you've got 3x to the power of 6. You bring the 6 down, so you get 18x to the power of 5. You treat y as if it were a constant. Like the, like the number 3. So you get 18x to the power of 5y. And when you differentiate the second term there, the 6y over z, you get 0 because there's no x term. And so if there's no x term and you differentiate with respect to x, you get 0. Uh, and you can do higher order partial derivatives. For instance, if you want to uh, differentiate f with respect to z twice, you differentiate with respect to once, and you'll get 6y over z squared. And when you differentiate it uh, again, you get minus 12y over z to the power of 3. Because if you're differentiating um, z below the line, you bring it above the line as a negative power. So basically what you're doing is you, you, you're differentiating z to the power of minus 1 twice. Okay, so that's what. So make sure that you're happy enough where these two, two things came from. So this is a kind of basic partial differentiation. And we're going to use basic partial differentiation in, in, in what's called vector calculus. So you need to know this, and you need to get happy with doing this. OK, so um, what I want to do now, guys, is I want to take two of your favorite things in the world, partial differentiation and vectors, and combine them. And that's what vector calculus essentially is. It's a combination of vector calculus and vectors. And who would not like that combination? All right, it's just perfect. So um, first thing I want to talk about is what's called a scalar field. And scalar fields are just special functions. So, and they have a special name. So some function is a special name. So if the inputs to the function are x, y, z, and t, or any subset of those four variables, then the function is called, sometimes called, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be called, but sometimes it's called a scalar field. All right, so it's just stupid terminology. And so therefore, you've, you see those two examples there. For f, what we've the, the previous slide, um, that's a scalar field because it's a function of x, y, and z. And g is a function of x and t. And that's also a scalar field because it can be a subset, any subset of x, y, z, and t. Now, when you're talking about scalar fields, it's understood that t represents time. And x, y, and z are the coordinates of a point in three-dimensional space. Okay, so you, 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 you arbitrarily chose a fixed point. You call it the origin or O. And then you refer everything, you, and then you put three perpendicular axes at this point O. And then every point in space can be located by its uh, coordinates with respect to those three axes. And we call the coordinates x, y, and z. So this is a very, very important little idea. So a scalar field, basically, from a mathematical point of view, when you're looking at it on the page, it's just a function of x, y, z, and t 
or any subset of those where it's understood that x, y, z are the positions are, are the coordinates of a point in space and t is time. And um, this is a very, and the reason why mm -hmm. these have a special name is because mm -hmm. that, that combination of variables is particularly important for engineering because we mm -hmm. live in a three-dimensional world, folks, and we also live in a world where time is important. Okay, so they're, 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 these four variables are the four variables primarily that you're interested in in engineering. So that's the reason why they have a special name. They're called a scalar field. And that's just the way it is. Um, you also have a vector field, and a vector field is just a vector whose components are all scalar fields. Okay, so but basically what it is, everything in front of i, j, and k are functions of x, y, z, and t, or any subset of those four variables. And, um, and, when you're, and so we, we're going to denote, denote, denote vectors using this kind of boldface notation. So for instance, there, a boldface f of x, y, and t is that combination there. Oh, look, it's, I made a mistake. Look, I've got a z there, and I haven't got a z on the left-hand side. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, I'm such a bad lecturer. But, it, but that's, just, that's just a little typo. For, for your amusement, all right? So you've got, um, but so any function of x, y, z, and t as a vector who's, uh, is, is called a vector field. And these are very, very important as well, folks. Now, i, j, and k are the unit directions, or the directions in the coordinate axes. So i is the unit vector in the x direction, j is the unit vector in the y direction, and k is the unit vector in the z direction. And that's the traditional notation. Okay, so i is it points along the x-axis, j points along the y-axis, k points along the z-axis. All right. So, but it, but from your perspective, folks, what you are interested in is you have a vector, and you know it's a vector because you've got i, j, and k. The components of the vectors, if the components of the vectors are all scalar fields, then you have what's called a vector field. Okay. So that's the stupid terminology. And here are two examples, folks. One on the left there is a, is is temperature over Ireland at a particular time. I can't remember when I when I did this. Okay, now temperature is a scalar field because temperature depends on the position. In this in this particular case, it depends on only two coordinates, x and y, depending on where you are in Ireland. So there you are, and um, it will change with time because temperature obviously in, in Ireland is going to change as you move through the night and through the day. It's, it's going to change. So, but but the important thing here, folks, is that temperature is a scalar field. It depends on its position. The temperature in Ireland depends on where you are in Ireland. So it's a, it's, a, it's a scalar field. And on the right is wind velocity in Ireland. And wind velocity is a vector field. It's a vector because wind velocity has a direction and it has a speed. And the arrows there represent the direction. And they're also supposed to represent in some way the magnitude as well. So if your arrow is, if the arrow is a little bit bigger than the smaller arrow, then the wind speed is bigger at the bigger arrow, okay? And actually, there's, a, there's also, it's also color-coded, but I'm not going to go into that. But these are examples of, 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 of scalar fields and vector fields because when you introduce them in a kind of a formal mathematical description, you might think that they're very mysterious and they're not very common when, in fact, they're very common. And in engineering, they're especially common. So especially in engineering education, in your engineering degree, you will come across temperature fields and vector fields a lot. Okay, so remember what a temperature field or what a, what a scalar field, folks, is. It, there's no direction involved, like something like temperature, and get the, and keep these two examples in your mind. Vector field, it kind of is like wind velocity. So you can imagine as you're going around the coast, the wind changes speed and it also changes direction. So therefore, the, the wind velocity is a vector, and it's a vector field because it changes um, at different points in Ireland and it changes over time as well, obviously. Okay. Now, I'm going to do, do this thing next. It's it's this is uh, I'm going to say it in, in in a minute. I'm going to need to say it here again. Um, it's not that important, really. There's an exception, and the exception is important. But this is this is just kind of I've I've made this up basically. Okay. Suppose you've got a vector v. Okay, it's a vector field. It depends on x, y, and z. Now you can differentiate. V, the vector V, with respect to X or Y or Z. Now, when you're differentiating vector fields, folks, the I, J, and K are constants, right? Remember what they are. They're, they're the directions along the X, Y, and Z axes. Their magnitude doesn't change because they're just, their they're, the magnitude is one, and their direction doesn't change. So when you, 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 you can't differentiate them, 
or you just leave them alone, in fact, when you're doing the differentiation. But if you want to differentiate a vector field, all you do is you differentiate each of the components of the vector with respect to the variable. Now, there's different notations, folks, for, differenti for differentiating vector fields. You can write it as delta v, delta y. Now, this the, the notation here is bad. The first one here is it, it, the, the, the actual software that I use using to print these. It doesn't do it very well. That's actually supposed to be boldface above the line there in the delta v, delta y. But sometimes you write it like this. You bring the delta delta y alongside the v. Some people like that. Some people then like putting brackets around the v. Whatever turns you on, okay? It doesn't matter. But as I say, guys, when you differentiate this vector field V here on the left with respect to Y, what you do is you go to the I components, you differentiate with respect to Y, and you get 2X. When you differentiate the J component, you get minus 15Y squared Z. And when you differentiate the Z component, you just get XZ. Okay? And you just keep the... the oh! And again, made another mistake, because there should be a K after the XZ. All right? So, um, and that's it. That's it. That's, it's as simple as that. Okay, so combining differentiation and vectors, partial differentiation and vectors, is really easy. All right? Now, unfortunately for you guys, um, it's not that important. You never do this in engineering analysis, actually. Okay? There is one exception which we'll talk about next, but this differentiation of vector fields like, like this is never done. Okay? It's just, it just, it's just the way um, the universe is that you don't actually need to do this a lot, but you can do it if you want to. Okay, so just keep this in mind. If you want to differentiate a vector field, do not be put off by the vector structure, just differentiate each of the components. And I could ask you this in the exam, although we you know it's, it's not a very important or common thing to do. There's one very, very important exception, folks, and that's when you're differentiating vector fields, which are functions of time. And this is really important. And there's a this this there's a backstory here with you know with regards to my own little academic journey, um, and this is what I I originally went into um, college. I think to study physics because I like I thought I liked physics, but then when I went to college, I realized that um, Felix is nonsense. Physics, phys, Felix, physics is nonsense. It didn't make any sense anymore. And one of the reasons why I much prefer mathematics um, and why mathematics appeals to me much more is because mathematics is very clean. It's a game that you play, but you know what the rules are. In physics, no, there's, it's no rules. All right? It's, it's, like, it's like baggage claim at an Italian airport. There are no rules. You just, just go straight in there and just, just do what you, whatever you, you, you need to do to survive. All right? Uh, and I'll explain this as, I, as I'm going on next. All right. Now, a very, very important concept is what's called the position vector of a particle. Or, yeah, suppose you have a little particle floating in space and it's a sphere, or you can imagine it to be a sphere, and let's call it P, P for particle, huh? All right. Now, the vector from the origin to the point P is called the position vector, and it's usually denoted by R. Okay. Now, in this case, in this little cartoon here, the distance along the i-axis is denoted by A, the distance along the j-axis is denoted by B, and the distance along the z-axis is denoted by, denoted by C. It can be any letters that you like. Sometimes it's x, y, and z, sometimes it's a, b, and c. It doesn't matter. Okay? So, if a particle is moving through space, then the components of R are, the, are functions of time so that you can write the position vector. I remember what R is now, folks. R is the, is the vector from the origin to the particle P, wherever it is in space. You can write it like this. So it's A along I plus B along J plus C along K. And that's the reason why vectors are somehow are, are kind of natural. When, when, you, when you first come across, when you first start messing about with vectors, I'm not sure if you do this in Leaving Cert anymore. I'm not sure if I if I did in leaving cert vectors. Oh, I must have done because I did physics. Yeah, so I must have done it, but I never really kind of, you know, saw the need for them. But in this case, it I don't know if it's obvious that you do. It, it's actually it's a natural thing to start thinking about vectors, because, uh, you to get from uh, O to P, you have to travel along the i at the x-axis, and let's call traveling along the x-axis i. 
let's call traveling along the, the y-axis j. Let's call traveling along the z-axis k. And the distance that you travel along the x-axis, in this case, we're calling it a and b and c for etc. Okay, so vectors do are kind of natural. They're kind of a natural concept if you start thinking about it. Um, but it was a major breakthrough, actually, in mathematics to kind of formulate the, this kind of idea of a position vector in terms of i, j, and k. So it's, 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 it's kind of obvious when you see it's done, when you see it done, but all the most brilliant concepts are simple when you see them in front of you. You think, oh yeah, of course, that's what it is. What, what, what else is it? Okay, so now guys, as I said, this is the reason why I, 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 I kind of switched to mathematics really, or it's just mathematics appealed to me so much more. If you have the position vector or of a particle, then you can define the velocity as the derivative with respect to time of the position vector with respect to time. So you differentiate or with respect to t. And how do you do that? All you do is you differentiate the components with respect to t. So this is the velocity vector, and this is how it's defined. Okay? Now, uh, in physics, when I, <laughs> I just stop. <laughs> Uh, going on about physics, but I don't know. In, in, in when I was taught physics, they 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 always kind of assumed that you knew what velocity was and what acceleration was, as if it's a natural concept, and it's not. And the idea that velocity is a vector is it? <laughs> Maybe it is, but when you define everything in as, as in kind of a formal mathematical um, space, it does actually make sense that vector that velocity is a vector because this idea of a position vector is a kind of a natural concept and all you're doing is you're differentiating the position vector with respect to time. Now guys, in an exam situation, well I'll do an example in a second now, that's all you're doing. You differentiate each of the components with respect to time. Now to get the speed, then all the speed is, is the magnitude of the velocity vector. And how do you get the magnitude of the vector? It's the square root of the first component squared plus the second component squared plus the third component squared by definition. So what's the, so so again, so this makes a lot more sense to me. Speed is just simply the magnitude of the velocity vector. There's no kind of stupid, you know, intu intuition being employed here. It, this is a definition of what speed is. And similarly, guys, acceleration then is just the derivative of the velocity. Okay. And oh, there's a there's a, there should be an equal sign there, and there isn't between dv dt and d squared or dt squared. There should be a, there should be an equal sign there. I know, I know. Um the, and it's not there, but it should be there. Um uh, and that's what, what what all acceleration is. It by definition, it's just the time derivative of the velocity vector. And that's just, if you remember what velocity is, that's the time derivative of the position vector. So velocity then, or acceleration then, is the second derivative of the position vector, or. And all you do, folks, is you do, you differentiate A with respect to T twice, you differentiate B with respect to T twice, and you differentiate C with respect to T twice. And that's all you do. So you need to know those three definitions, what velocity is, what speed is, and what acceleration is. And there is no physical intuition employed. None, just definitions. This is the kind of formal mathematical approach to this whole kind of physics kind of idea. And it makes, to me, a lot more sense. All right, there's no hand waving. There's just, here it is, just do this. Okay, it's the Michael O'Leary thing. You know, just do this and shut up, you know. And there's no, and that's that's fair enough, right? So that, that's what you do. Now, what kind of, question can I ask you to, to get this or can I ask you to do and it's going to be this simple folks you will have a position vector or and there'll be some function of time multiplying the i some function of time multiplying the j and some function of time multiplying the k and all you have to do then is you differentiate to get the velocity you differentiate the i component with respect to time the j component with respect to time and the k component with respect to time and add them Okay, so that, so in this case, if you differentiate the i component with respect to time, you get 3 multiplied by 2, which is 6t squared. And then when you differentiate exponential minus 3t, you get minus 3 exponential minus 3tj. And when you differentiate minus 5t plus 1 with respect to t, you just get minus 5. All right, boom, boom. That's all it is. So that's all velocity is. 
To get the speed now, guys, we need to get the magnitude of that vector. So it's going to be the square root of 6t squared plus minus 3 exponential minus 3 squared plus minus 5 squared. Like this, as I said. And then you multiply it out, folks, you get 36t to the power of 4. Um, you get 9 exponential minus 6t and you get 25. And it's exponential minus 6t because when you multiply exponential minus 3t by exponential minus 3t, you add the powers. So you get minus 6t. All right. That's all it is. And that's speed. All right. And then acceleration, folks, then is you take the velocity vector and you differentiate each of those components with respect to time. So the first one there is 6t squared. When I differentiate that with respect to time, I'm going to get 12t. Uh -huh. When I differentiate the, the j component, I'm going to get plus 9 exponential minus 3t because minus 3 by minus 3 it gives me plus 9. And when I differentiate minus 5 with respect to t, I get 0 because 5 and minus 5 is a constant. And that's what you get. Now, sometimes I can ask you to maybe evaluate one of those or one of one or more of those quantities at some time. And then all you do, guys, is you replace the t by whatever value that I'm interested in. So if I want the speed at t equal to zero, it's this simple. You replace t by zero and um, you get nine. Um, exp so when I replace t by zero, t to the power of four, zero to the power of four is zero. Exponential of zero is one. So I get the square root of 34. That's it. Now, guys, I'm, 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 um, I'm giving you this stuff. You know, this is, this is so easy. You've got to love this. Love this is what I'm saying. Okay. Now, here's, here's my bug. I'm back to physics again. I'm back to how much I hate physics. All right. Because here, here it is. Here's, here, here's what I, I, I said. Enough is enough. Oh, no, I don't. No, that's, that's, the, that's the next slide. Okay. First, I want to talk about circular motion. Okay. If you see that, that combination there, guys, um, r cos omega t along i plus r sine omega t along j, that describes motion in the circle. Although it might not be obvious to you that it does. When I was your age, it wasn't that obvious at all that it does. But you can actually just, you know, r is some number, omega is some number. Um, r is the maybe the, is is the is the, um, the radius of the motion, and omega is what's called the angular velocity. Okay, so when you've got something rotating, moving in a circle, um, omega, the, the number multiplying the t, is called the angular velocity. And the thing multiplying the cos and the sine is called, maybe it's called the, um, it's called the radius of motion. All right, so I want to look at an example. Uh, let me look at 2 cos 3t along i plus 2 sine 3t along j. And what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to, I'm going to plot um, the um, x and y coordinates for specific times. So at t equal to zero, if you replace these uh, t equal to zero, you're just going to get the number, you're going to get two along i. And on the left hand side of the, the, the leftmost little graphic there, um, that's represented there by the blue dot. If I put in t equal to one into that formula, what I get, I, I, I get uh, it, it's almost touching the, the negative x-axis, and but that's what you get. So you get two cos three along i plus two sine three uh, along j and that gives you the point that's pretty close to the uh, negative x-axis there so it's stopping just before the x-axis and then if I go further if I put in t equal to 2 it's going it's it's getting close back to where it's starting from okay so so the way I convinced myself that this is, was actually circular motion when I was your age and I had no friends and I and, and I don't know if that's still true um I know friends so I used to do this <laughs> god love me I never took I never took anything on trust. So I, I said, okay, let me just take an example and see what happens. And this is what happens, folks. So what if so at this stage, what I want you to be able to do, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to take on trust that the, the first line there represents motion in a circle. Now, here we go. Here's physics rant part three. First year physics, they love circular motion. God love them, they do. And the way cir the way this was taught to me was like a diagram on the bottom of the page there. Okay, so you got motion in a, cir in a circle, and guy, the guy, the guy came in and started drawing arrows on the circle, and he said that if you've got a particle rotating in a circle, then the velocity at each point is tangential to the circle, and the acceleration is towards the center. Okay, and as if as if this is obvious that it's obviously true that that's the case. 
All right. And you notice also that velocity and acceleration are perpendicular to each other in this diagram. And, and, and I think then we went on. <laughs> we did something else. All right. This is, this is just madness. All right. Now, it's not intuitive at all. That's the case. That velocity is tangential when you've got circular motion and that the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity and is towards the center of the center of the circle. It's not obvious at all. But if you take a mathematical point of view, folks, it makes sense. But it only makes sense within the context of mathematics. You formally define, you define what velocity, speed, and acceleration are, and you do the bloody calculations. And you don't rely this rely, rely on this hand wavy kind of, oh, you all know what this stuff is. Nobody knows anything. All right. So um, here's here's circular motion properly done. Right? So I told you in the previous slide that you have to accept that this describes circular motion. If I want to get the velocity here, guys, I'm going to differentiate that with respect to t. Now, when I differentiate the cos omega t with respect to t, I get minus sine omega t. But I also must differentiate inside the cos with respect to t, and I get omega. And when I differentiate the sine omega t, I get cos omega t multiplied by omega, and this is what I get. Okay? That's it. Now, the speed then is the square root of the i term squared plus the j term squared. And you can bring the r squared omega squared outside because it's common. And then you use the fact that cos squared plus sine squared is always 1. And you're left then with the square root of r squared omega squared. And that's just r omega. Boom, boom. So the speed of a particle in circular motion is r omega. All right. So it does actually make sense. And I say, guys, when I was taught this, I was told that the speed was r omega without any explanation. It was just daft. But maybe physicists have this great intuition, but I think they don't. I think they're just making it up. Acceleration, folks, is the same. You take the velocity vector, you differentiate that with respect to time. And again, remember that you have to differentiate inside both cos and sine with respect to omega. And that's what you get. Now, in this case, guys, look, you see there's an omega square term common or there's a minus omega square common in each of the i and j terms for the acceleration. You can bring that outside. And what you're left with inside the brackets then is what you started off with, r. So a is minus omega squared r. And remember what r is. r is going from the origin to the particle. And so minus r is in the opposite direction. And that's the reason why when you've got circular motion, you've got uh, acceleration is going towards the center because it's in the direction of minus r. And the acceleration, the magnitude of it is omega squared. OK, there's more. There's more physics nonsense then again, folks, because then they said, well, um, why don't the planets fall into the sun when they're rotating? Because the acceleration is towards the center. So the planets should be just diving into the sun. And they say, well, they are, their everyday experience in physics is that things don't dive into the sun. Planets stay in their orbit above the sun. So they made up a force. So they say, oh, there must be another force that happens when you've got circular motion. And one of them is called centripetal force, and one of them is centrifugal force, one of them is real, and one they just made up because they could. What a daft subject. It, just stay away from physics, folks. Stay with maths. Stay with me. I'm your friend. All right? Let's, let's go on. Now, here we go. This is really the meat of it. This is the start of the meat of it. So you need to be able to calculate what's called, you, you need to be able to use the gradient operator. All right. So it's denoted by either grad or this um, triangle on its point. That's the Greek letter nabla, if you can believe it. Um, so and I'm just going to call it gradient. So what you do, folks, what the, what, what the gradient operator does, it takes a scalar field, which is just a function of x, y, and z, and it converts it into a vector field. Now, that's very important. What you get as a result of the gradient is a vector. If in an exam situation, I ask you to get the gradient of a scalar field and you give me a scalar, you will get zero points because that is the whole point of the gradient. It takes a scalar and it converts it into a vector. Do not forget that. You must get a vector. 
and there's a formal definition of what the gradient operator is. And here it is. It's delta f delta x along i plus delta f delta y along j plus delta f delta z along k. And why is it defined that way? It's defined that way because people have found this to be very convenient. And that's all, that's the only reason. Like, why is it x along i, y along j, and z along k? Why isn't it just, why isn't it all just delta f delta x along i plus delta f delta x along j? Because it's, it's not convenient. People have found that this operator describes how the universe works in certain situations. It's just bizarre. And it's just, it's just, it's, you know, God is a mathematician, right? Because some things, like, for instance, heat flow um, is governed by this gradient operator. It, and that's not obvious, but it's true. All right, so this is a very important physical quantity, but I don't want you to think about it in terms of physics, because that's bad thinking. All I want you to think about is this in terms of mathematics. It's a definition that you need to remember. All right, so it takes a scalar and converts it into a vector in precisely this way. And why? Why this specific form? Is because I'm telling you this is the form. And there's that's it. You do what you're told. Right, let's look, look at an example. Um, f is a scalar field. It's 3xyz. I want you to find the gradient of f, and then the gradient of f at a specific point, 0, minus 1, 1. And then I want you to get the magnitude of the gradient of f, because the gradient of f is a vector, so it has a magnitude. All right. So what you do, folks, here is you get the gradient of f is you must you must take f and differentiate respect to x. So you get 3yz. When you differentiate respect to y, you get 3xz. When you differentiate respect to z, you get 3xy. And then you just multiply it by i, j, and k. That's it. And that's all it is. Now, guys, um, if nothing else from my part of the course, remember this. That's all it is. And students, for some reason, have a resistance to this. I don't understand it. It's a, it's a definition. Apply the damn definition. Come on. I Maybe it's beneath people. Maybe it's beneath you. And, and you think, oh, come on, Jerry. You know, challenge me, dude. Forget challenges now, folks. Let's just survive here, all right? And um, that's what you do. You differentiate the scale with respect to x, respect to y, respect to z, and you multiply the corresponding derivatives then by i, j, and k. Nothing could be simpler, folks. Come on. Now, if I want the gradient of f then at a specific point, all I do is I replace x by 0, y by minus 1, and z by 1. So if you look at the first component of um, the gradient of f here, which is 3yz, I'm going to get 3 multiplied by minus 1 by 1. Okay? If you look at the j component, you get 3xz, so it's 3 by 0 by 1, and then 3 by 0 by minus 1. So because x is equal to 0, the j and k terms drop out, and what you get then is just minus 3i. That's it. That's all it is. And then the magnitude of the gradient of f, guys, is you go back up to the gradient of f definition. You take the i component, which is 3yz. You square that. You square the 3xz. You square the 3xy. And you add them together. And you take the square root. Why? Because that is how you get the gradient or the magnitude of a vector. And in this case, the vector I'm interested in is the gradient of f. That's it. Um, and you see there's a 9 term common there. So I brought the 9 outside the square root sign because the square root of 9 is 3. But you don't have to do that. You only do this if, you're, if, you, if you want to please me. All right? Leave the 9 inside if you want to. But if you're, if, you're, you know, if you're into this stuff, you can bring the 3 outside. And that would be wonderful if you did. And I would really appreciate it. Okay? Now, directions and directional derivatives. You might want to pause here, but I'm going to continue on and push on and just get this stuff done. All right. Um, this is um, this is easy, but you might want to pause this and just go and get a cup of coffee and come back. But I'm going to, as I say, going to push on through and get this done. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah. Now, what's very important in this game, and th th this is a game that we're playing, is that the word direction in vector calculus has a specific meaning. It means that the vector has magnitude 1. So a direction is a unit vector. And that is very, very important. So if you ever see direction in this 
context, in the context of vector calculus, you know that its magnitude must be 1. And if it's not 1, you must make it 1. And I'll show you in a second how you do that. Okay? So if you think back to, you know, the I, IJK um, vectors associated with the Cartesian coordinate system, I is the unit vector in the, uh, in the x direction, and its magnitude is 1. Okay? So that's why it's called a direction. So it's the I direction because its magnitude is 1. It points along the x-axis, that's fine, but what's, what makes it a direction, though, is that it's, its magnitude is 1. So, for example, if you look at this vector here, it's i plus 3j, and I want to see what the, what's the direction associated with this vector. Now, remember, vectors have two quantities associated with them. They've got a magnitude and a direction. And now, in what direction in the context of vector calculus means is that it's a unit vector. So, in this case, we see that this is not a unit vector because if you calculate the magnitude of a, you get the square root of 1 plus 9, which is 10. So to get the direction, in the, in, in the, if you want to get the direction of the vector a, what you do then is you divide each of the components of a by the square root of 10. So you get 1 over root 10 plus 3 over root 10 log j. Now, again, guys, is this crucial to your engineering education? Um, when you're walking along the factory floor and someone's shouting out, you know, does anyone know how to get the direction of a vector? Uh, th that's not going to happen. All right. But uh, with, within the context of what we're doing at the moment in your en engineering education, and particularly this particular course, it is kind of important. All right. Um, and usually the direction is denoted by a hat. Uh, well, I'm going to use, I'm going to denote the, the direction by a hat. So if you have a, a vector A, its direction is, got, is called a hat. And it's, uh, as I say, you divide each of the components then by the magnitude. Okay. Here's an important definition. If B is a direction, then B dot the gradient of F is called the grade, is called the derivative of F in the direction of B, or the directional derivative of F, or the rate of change of F in the direction of B. All right. So this combination, B dot the gradient of F, is very important in the vector calculus. And you will notice, guys, that we've got B dot the gradient of F. This is the scalar product of two vectors. So what I'm going to get as a result of multiplying B by the gradient of F using the dot product, I'm going to get a scalar. And that's very important. So I'm going to get a scalar. I'm going to get a number as a result of doing this. What in is particularly important, though, in the context of this question, is that b dot the gradient of f, in the con when you're doing that, com that, that, that combination, b must be a unit vector. And if it's not a unit vector, you must make it a unit vector, as I did for the vector a. All right. So it's just, this is this. Now, I'm making this sound, this, this sound a lot more difficult than it is, really, because the, in terms of a question, what you can be asked to do, um, it's it's very straightforward. Let me show you. All right, this looks difficult, and you're going to say you're going to be oh I'm afraid of this. Uh, it, it's don't be afraid. It's very very easy. It's there's a I think it's a four step process here to getting the answer, and why not? It's very very straightforward. You've got a scalar field here, guys. X squared sine y, and you want to get the derivative of this of f in the direction of i minus two j at the point two pi. All right, and um, when you first come across these kind of questions, um, it's probably there's too, there's too much information probably given to you. You're, 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 like there's too many things happening at the same time. But you just must be careful. Be an accountant and just do it step by step carefully and just do it, just do it carefully. So we know that the derivative in a direction um, um, is b dot the gradient of f. So we need to get the gradient of f first, guys. So. When I get the gradient of f here, I must differentiate f respect to x. I get 2x sine y along i. And then I differentiate x squared sine y respect to y, and I get x squared cos y along j. So that's the first thing you do. You get the gradient of f, because I want the derivative of f in the direction of a. OK? And then you get the gradient of f at the point that you're interested in, 2 pi. So you replace x by 2 and y by pi. And when you do that, because sine of pi is 0 and the cos of pi is minus 1 and x is equal to 2, you get minus 4j. All right? Because sine of pi is 0, cos of pi is minus 1. Now, 
you need to get the direction corresponding to the vector a, which is i minus 2j. So you need to get the magnitude of a. And when I do that, I get the square root of 5. So to get a hat in this context, guys, I must divide each of the components of a by the square root of 5. I've done that here. And then what I do is I get the dot product of 2 and 3. Step 2 and step 3, I get the dot product. Remember how you get the dot product when you've got components of a vector. You multiply corresponding components and add. So if you look at the, the first one there, the gradient of f of 2 pi, there's no i component there. So you're going to multiply 0 by 1 over root 5, and you're going to multiply minus 4 by minus 2 over root 5. And when you do that uh, and add those two things together, you get 8 over root 5. What could be easier? All right, this is something like, I don't know, you know, this is, I can't say anything now because this is going to go on loop. I, so I, I, if, if this was in, in, um, in, in face to face lectures, I would, I would, I would, I, I would be, I would denigrate some, some um, degree course on in DCU that's not engineering. And I think we all know what engineer what degree course I'm talking about. All right. We, we know, we know what, 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 what really doesn't matter. And we know what matters. This matters. Mm, I'm not sure about everything else. Okay. So this matters here and it's very, very easy. Okay. And it looks difficult as a, at the start guys. Uh, and you might shy away from this, but don't. It's just a question of practice this, of practicing this and getting it right. All right. That's all it is. Now, um, associated with the gradient of operator is this notion of maximum and minimum rate of change. And this is very important in engineering analysis. So um, you might be interested, if you think back at maybe to the, um, the temperature map of Ireland, um, and you, um, uh, you might stand, you know, you're, you're at a position in Ireland, and you want to walk in the direction of the greatest increase in temperature because you want to be warm. You want to get warmer. So which direction should you go in? And, uh, yeah, and, and and then you might also be interested in maybe oh I want to get the um, the direction I want you're, you're too warm and you want to walk in the direction uh, that's going to make you coldest. What direction is that? So if you think about it, you know from a you know in the map of Ireland, it's, it's you know you can go any direction of three three sixty degrees, right? So if it, what direction should you go to get them to heat up quickest, and what direction should you go to cool down quickest? And um, that kind of idea has uh, has an, uh, analogs in many many other fields so this is an important little concept uh, when you first come across it, it it's a little bit confusing but don't be confused because it's just a question of just sticking with this and and, and going for it now the rate of change of a scalar field f in any direction b by definition is b dot the gradient of f that's it so that's the rate of change of f in any direction is b dot grad, 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 grad f now, the scalar product of two vectors has two ways of being calculated. You can use the, the component form, which we've already done, or you can use what's called the geometrical interpretation. And what you do to get the gradient, or you get the dot product of two vectors, is you get the magnitude of the first vector, you get the magnitude of the second vector, and you get the cost of the angle between them. Okay? By definition, that's what the dot product is. Now, the magnitude of b is 1, because b is a direction. Okay? So, the rate of change of f in any direction b is given by that formula there. Okay? Now, we want to maximize that. We want to maximize the mod of the gradient of f by cos of theta. Now, the way you maximize this, folks, is very simple. You look at cos of theta. Okay? Where is cos theta maximum? Well, the, max, the maximum of cos theta is 1, and it occurs when theta is equal to 0. And, and this means that b and the gradient of f are in the same direction. And when you think about it, this means that the maximum rate of change is the modulus of the gradient of f, and it occurs in the direction of the gradient of f, because the gradient of f is a vector and so therefore has a direction. Whoa, you're saying, no way, Jerry, am I going with this? It's actually not too bad. Yeah, I'll do an example in a second. Okay. But that line there that, that, that I just brought on screen is very important. The max rate of change of a scalar field F is the modulus of the gradient of F, and it occurs in the direction of the gradient of F. 
And similarly, folks, you can argue the same thing because the minimum of cos theta is minus 1. Um, the minimum rate of change is minus the modulus of the grain of f, and it occurs in the direction of minus grad f. Okay, let's do an example and wrap it up. Okay. Here's a function, x squared y plus y z, and we're interested in the how this function is behaving at the point 1, 2, minus 1, and we want to find its rate of change with distance in the vector, uh, the rate of change with distance in the direction i plus 2j plus 3k. First, okay, let's, 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 let's do this problem first. So you get, um, you know that a is a, uh, a, it's not a unit vector, it has magnitude of the square root of 14. So the unit vector a hat then is 1 over root 14, 2 over root 14, and 3 over root 14 in the corresponding directions. The grain of f, in this case, is very simple. You differentiate with respect to x, you get 2xy. You differentiate with respect to y, you get x squared plus z. And you differentiate with respect to z, you get y. And you evaluate that then at x equal to 1, y equal to 2, and z equal to minus 1, and you get 4i plus 2k. Okay? Now, so the rate of change then, guys, is you get the dot product of a hat and the grain of f. And in this case, you get 10 over root 14. Okay, so that's the first. And we've done this problem before, actually. This is another example of the same thing. Now, here's the second question. What is the greatest rate of change of f? I forgot to put that in. Sorry, guys, so I'm putting it in now verbally. What is the greatest rate of change of f, and in what direction does it occur? Now, you have to remember what this is. This is the definition. The greatest rate of change is the magnitude of the grain of f. And so if you go to the gradient of f at the point 1, 2, minus 1, you see it's 4i plus 2k. And you just get the magnitude of that vector. And you get marks for that. So the greatest rate of change is the square root of 20 because it's 16 plus 4. And the square root of that. So the greatest rate of change then is the magnitude of the gradient of f. And the direction then, folks, all you, the direction of the greatest rate of change is you go back up again to the gradient of f at the point 1, 2, minus 1, which is 4i plus 2k, and you divide each of those components by the square root of 20. That's it. You can tidy this up a little bit if you want to because the square root of 20 is uh, is is 2 times root 5, and there's a, there's a, square, there's a, there's a cancellation there. Oh, ho, ho, if you wanted to do that, but that's not that's, that's not essential. Okay, do not get confused by these two problems, folks. They look alike, but they are a little bit different. The first one there is just get you calculating the um, direction derivative, and in the second part of this question, you're getting the greatest rate of change, which is a very important physical quantity, and the direction of the greatest rate of change, which is also another very very important physical quantity, um, and it's uh, and they're kind of different. They're fundamentally different. Okay, so do not get confused by the two types of problem. And there are only two types of problems that really I can ask you in this, in this context here. Okay, guys, that's it. I'm going to um, stop here. And um, I'll talk to you again soon.